Reason's Los Angeles headquarters. Uh, outer space is the final frontier, as we all know, and a grand arena for imagining uh, potential new advancements for human liberty, not to mention human accomplishments. Now, for the first few decades of uh, human attempts to get ourselves into space, space flight was largely a monopoly of governments, but we're now moving into a dawning age of space travel and possible space living that's accomplished by private enterprise. And my guest here today at Recent TV is one of the men helping make that happen. He is Doug Jones, a co-founder and chief test engineer of the private space tech company XCore, where he not only helps design liquid rocket engines, uh, they call him the Rocket Whisperer, for his uncanny ability to troubleshoot rocket propulsion systems, he's also personally test flown XCore's experimental craft, like the rocket-powered aircraft, the X-Racer. He's a real space age renaissance man. We're very glad to have him here. Doug Jones. Thank you. So Doug, XCore, uh, you co-founded the company. Tell us a little bit about what XCore was founded to do, what it's done, and what you think you're going to do next. Um, when we all got laid off from Rotary Rocket in the summer of 1999. And that was a prior private space tech company, prior right? Prior private space tech company. And did it go it under entirely? Go yeah, yeah. It, it, it died eventually about two years later. And um, all of us just really hadn't had enough. We, we knew that it was possible to make this happen and that if one organization couldn't make it happen, well, maybe we could roll our own and make it, make mm -hmm. it do. And so basically Dan, Nalita, and I grabbed Jeff Grayson, who was our boss at Rotary Rocket, and said, you aren't done leading, and basically volunteered him to be the CEO of XCore. Mm -hmm. And none of us regretted it. We certainly, they, none of us knew how much work it would be to get from there to here. And, uh, but the journey has been more than worth it. And uh, when you launched, uh, what was your sense of what you wanted to accomplish and, and how far have the company, as well as you personally, and we, how far have you gotten along that path? We all knew that there was no way that the, the government space program was going to get us personally into space. Mm -hmm. And all of us have the space bug that bad. I've had it since I was five years old. And the only way that we were going to get to go was if we built the ride ourselves. Mm -hmm. There was no other way that it could happen. Is that certainly none of us were independently wealthy enough to simply buy a ride to go to the space station, for mm -hmm. instance. And that's you know, a kind of a token commercialization of a government system when you're riding on a Soyuz. And what we really want is something that we could all, all go on that. And, uh, and I want to take my wife up for a wedding anniversary mm. in a space, space, space station. So uh, the only way I can actually make that happen is to build our own ride. Is that common in the private space industry that people are driven by this very personal desire to get to space themselves? Um, yes. Yeah. I've really seen that, you know, Elon Musk has talked about how he wants to retire on Mars. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Jeff Grayson has talked about how he wants to retire on Mars. I want to ask both of them if they could survive in a col colony of 20 or 30 people, and one of them is Bob Zubrin, but we'll <laughs> pass on that. And. Uh, Everyone else that I know that has founded these companies, you know, John Carmack, Dave Maston, all of them want to go themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far, those of us at XCore are the only founders of the company that have actually gotten the ride themselves. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now um, the Easy Rocket was an early XCore accomplishment. I understand that was the first private rocket-powered aircraft. Is that correct? As far yeah. as we can tell, yes, yeah. that uh, there were rocket-powered aircraft that were built by corporations but under government funding, for mm -hmm. instance, at the time. We did this purely on spec because at the time, back in uh, 2000, I looked at the uh, long list of static engine test stands that various small companies and universities and uh, amateur organizations had put together and built rocket engines and tested them, but yeah. they hadn't flown a human being on a rocket. Right. A static is where it's the engine's going off, but it's not propelling yeah, it's anything. Yeah, just bolted down. Yeah. You're just testing the engine. Yeah. And uh, w the one thing that we could see that we could accomplish quickly with the resources we had at hand was to demonstrate that we could fly people routinely and safely on rocket engines that we had designed and built. Mm -hmm. And that was what that was really our breakout in 2001 was when we started flying the easy rocket and it was you know we got news coverage we got lots of press and people in the industry started taking this more seriously yeah. and within a year after that when Elon Musk had started SpaceX and they wanted to do their first testing of their gas generator for the Merlin engine and they didn't yet have test facilities they came to us 
and did their first testing of their hardware on our test equipment. So the Easy Rocket served its purpose of establishing basically our calling card yeah. as a rocket engine development team. Uh, that leads in an interesting area. There is amazingly, you know, for those of us who've been watching this from the beginning, a lot of competition in the field of private space. Uh, SpaceX, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. gets a lot of press, uh, Virgin Galactic. Uh, within the field, is there a, a sense of friendly collaboration, more competition? Um, how do you guys all interact with each other? Um, it varies, you know, basically, sometimes based on the personalities of the principals involved. Um, later this week, I'm meeting with some guys from Maston to, dis to discuss buying some valves from them to put into our system. Yeah. And it, it's, what we're all looking forward to is being able to get, around, get out of vertical integration where you build everything up and down in your, in, in your one organization. If we can start buying valves from Maston right. and, and other components from another vendor and having somebody else use their machine shop to build some components for us, yeah. then that basically, you know, basic economics, when, right. you, when you let someone else do what they're good at, it yeah. lets you specialize on what you're good at. Right, so in the beginning, there was, there was almost a lack of this division of labor. Like you said, you were all trying to do everything from the ground up, and, and maybe that's changing a bit. And it, as much as possible, and, uh, but still there are times when we have to design a valve to do a purpose because we can't find any commercial product that will do the yeah. task that we want. And sometimes we can get existing vendors to design a change to their existing product mm -hmm. to make it better for us. Yeah. Uh, now I know one of your big projects in the works is the Lynx. Could you uh, sort of explain a little bit about what the Lynx is and what it will do? Lynx, uh, which we uh, will have flying later this year, is our third rocket plane. We did the Easy Rocket, the X Racer, and now we're working on the Lynx. And the Lynx Mark I is basically our first hack at it, where we get all of our the steep part of the learning curve out of the way before we go on to the more um, production model Mark II. The Lynx Mark I is a uh, delta-winged, uh, uh, twin-tailed, uh, rather generic looking rocket plane, looks a little bit like the old uh, dinosaur from the 1960s. Two seat vehicle, uh, pilot, one participant, and uh, suborbital takes off from the runway on LOX kerosene, rocket engine power, flies up to, in the Mark I, peak altitude of around 200,000 feet. And the Mark II will go to over 328,000 feet, 100 kilometers, the Von Karman line. And the idea is to take uh, participants and payloads up on a suborbital flight out of the atmosphere, several minutes of zero G, several minutes above most of the atmosphere so that you can take a telescope up and do observations. And where this looks like it'll have a lot of uh, scientific use to it is to aid researchers in developing hardware which would later go on to orbital missions, mm -hmm. but get a lot of suborbital experiments done to help them develop their hardware and make sure that when they do go to the expense of an orbital flight, yeah. it's more likely to work well. If you could quickly explain the suborbital sub versus orbital distinction for non-rocket uh, jockeys in our audience. In a orbital system, you're actually getting up completely out of the atmosphere and getting enough horizontal velocity so that essentially um, your centrifugal force holds you up above the Earth. Yeah. And that requires reaching uh, over five miles per second, uh, close to eight kilometers per second total velocity change to get to that point. And it's a very challenging task. It typically takes two or three stages of a rocket vehicle dropping the empty ones off on your way up. Suborbital is a much simpler task. Your total velocity change is, is less than a third as much you're only going up to about 100 kilometers altitude instead of three or 400, mm -hmm. and you're going to much lower speeds. Yeah. And when you're coming back, you're at lower speeds so that you don't have as much heat to deal with on the reentry. Okay. And so it's just an up and return. Yeah. Your total flight time is around half an hour, and uh, it's a lower energy, lower expense, lower risk mission. Right but still gets you most of the experience. Yeah, and are you guys already selling tickets for the passenger part of the Lynx For experience? the spaceflight participant part, yeah. yes. We're selling tickets. Um, I'm, you know, busily grinding away on getting the hardware built, so I haven't been keeping track of the mm -hmm. sales. But we've got a few hundred so far and reservations for more. And uh, the, the, as the hardware comes together, you know, as someone who started off as an enthusiast and has become a professional, 
it boggles me sometimes that you know that anybody's doing this and that I'm part of the team is just every now and then I have to pinch myself. Yeah. Um, the links. What's its turnaround time going to be? You go up, you come down. When can you go back up again? Um, we want to be able to get at least four missions per day, which means uh, you have to be able to turn it around in under an hour. Yeah. We've demonstrated turning around previous vehicle, the X Racer, doing the complete uh, liquid oxygen, kerosene, and helium recharge needed to replenish the propellants, and I think we did it in about eight and a half minutes. That was with a kind of an IndyCar style a approach to it, where we had three teams approaching the vehicle from three different directions. Yeah. And so we had liquid oxygen loading and helium loading and fuel loading all going on in separate areas, everybody using their own tools. And so if we can do an Indy style turnaround in under 10 minutes, we can do a much more relaxed one in about an hour. Wow. And the, the re-entry heat aspect of it is you've solved that problem? It's, it's modest. Yeah. Uh, most of the aircraft is indeed a composite structure with you know, a resin and, and glass or, or uh, carbon fiber in it. Mm -hmm. And it's only at the very nose and leading edges of the wings and other surfaces that we need to have an extra little bit of thermal protection. The peak temperature is under 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It wouldn't even glow because we're doing, even with the Mark II, only a little bit more than, than Mach 3 on yeah. re-entry. So the peak temp heating is comparable to a high-speed aircraft. Yeah. Now, you of yourself have test piloted an earlier X-Core uh, plane. Not, not, not piloted. I've yeah. been the flight test engineer in the right seat. Okay. And what this does is it, it frees up the pilot in the yeah. left seat to focus on flying the aircraft. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the flight test engineer in the right seat is watching all the propulsion systems. Mm -hmm to make sure those are behaving well. And with an experimental system, it helps to have somebody focus just on that. Yeah, and did you have your weightless moments in these uh, test flights? Was um, well, this was yeah. all subsonic, okay. in-atmosphere stuff. Yeah. And uh, rather than weightless moments, we had uh, high G moments where we were doing, for instance, a split S. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing quite like coming around the pattern at 100 knots kicking in the engine, accelerating to 200, and then pulling up into a, into a half loop at three and a half Gs. It kind of gets your attention. Yeah. Want to talk a little bit about the ways your private business intersects with government. Uh, first of all, on the regulatory level, like how, who, who or what in government has their eyes on what you guys are doing? Like does FAA have any say? In the, there's yeah. a branch of the yeah. FAA called AST. It's the Associate Administrator for Space Transportation, and they have the responsibility for licensing uh, space launches and re-entries. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you do once you're in orbit is not of their concern. You kind of want to tra coordinate your traffic with the Air Force, who keeps track of objects in orbit. But uh, we've been talking with the government since even before XCOR was founded. And uh, that helps you by having a, an ongoing relationship with them, you know, meeting them several times a year. We, both Jeff and, and Randall Clegg, our, uh, our uh, government liaison guy, spend a lot of time going to D.C. and going to meetings and pushing back against some of the, the less well thought out regulations and helping propose the regulations that we think would be fair and honest and, and a level playing field for everybody involved. Are you guys feeling overall that they are reacting to you and what you do in a sensible way? Is there any big examples of foolish um, things they've tried to do? Possibly the best example of them doing a wonderful thing was when they announced the rule on what a suborbital space flight is. Mm -hmm. And it was at the Space Access Conference, got about 10 years ago. And um, they said that uh, a, a suborbital spacecraft is rocket powered and has thrust greater than lift for the majority of the powered portion of the ascent. Mm -hmm. And they got a round of applause from all these free market people in the audience because it was such yeah. a sensible rule because aviation generally goes horizontal. Right. Rockets generally go up. Yeah. They drew the line at 45 degrees. I mean, instead of coming up with something really complicated, they came up with a rule that was based on the dynamics of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So even a tail sitting rocket that only goes up for 10 seconds and then lands right back where it came from, that's a suborbital rocket. Hmm. Whereas the easy rocket, our first rocket plane, which had relatively little thrust and couldn't climb steadily at a 45 degree angle, yeah. that was still an airplane. Okay. So it was a sensible decision, and the government is not the enemy. They're just a big blundering beast that you can kind of nudge in the right direction. 
Uh, is there any sense in which uh, do you have any kind of client relationship with the government? Is NASA now using companies like you to provide them services? Um, we've had contracts with um, government organizations before, the Air Force, NRO, Navy, NASA. Um, I think the largest co government contract we had was back in 06 and 07 when we developed a, a large methane engine, which was potentially going to be the main propulsion for the crew exploration vehicle. Mm -hmm. And they decided they wanted to advance the, the schedule more and realized they didn't have time to develop advanced propulsion for it and then went back to the old tetroxide, hydrazine, off-the-shelf stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were very pleased with the results we got and uh, the trouble is they just basically ran out of money because so many other things were soaking up their budget. What uh, does XCOR or maybe even you as a person have a vision of where you want the space business to be say 10, 20 years from now and is government a necessary part of that vision in any way? Um, it's a, it's a, you have to deal with the government anytime you're doing stuff which is under regulation but uh, various branches of the government can also be customers and we would be just delighted if 10 years from now the space station or whatever new Bigelow system that, uh, and I kind of envision that once ISS has gotten too old and needs to be retired, some components of it may have, say, a large Bigelow inflatable added and then basically split it up and salvage it into various components. And Bigelow is another uh, private space company, right, that's dedicated to building essentially living areas and stuff. Yes, they, yeah. they, they, they bought the TransHab technology from NASA and then went on and developed it further. Mm -hmm. And they have plans for space stations up to many, many times the volume of the International Space Station and they will need transportation for their commercial customers and that's one of the potential customers for our later orbital system which we would be basically running a taxi service to and from low earth orbit and um your current price now is around ninety five thousand is that right yes yeah um is that uh, is that a necessary function of just how much it costs in propulsion to get things to space or do you see the cost curve on that falling um, and why would it? The, the, the price and cost are yeah. often loosely coupled mm -hmm. and when you come up with a new service you price it as high as you can to skim off the top of the market. Sure. I mean the, the main purpose, the main function of wealthy people in society is to serve as the guinea pigs for the rest of us <laughs> so that you know we can extract a maximum value from them in making them feel that they are you know truly special people. And, you know, that's what tourism is all about. Yeah. And so the, 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 there's a certain amount of cynicism to that, yeah. but that's the way it often tends to work out yeah. in the real world. Does a whole new level of regulation come in when you're taking on paid passengers? That's where the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004 came in. Mm -hmm. um, actually, x -Corps people wrote the first draft of that, and we had people help push it through Congress. And the idea there is that for spaceflight participants, unlike commercial transport on aircraft, mm -hmm. it's not presumed to be state safe for the participant. Oh. Instead, it's an informed consent regime, which is more like going skydiving yeah. or mountain climbing, where you have to sign a consent form that says, yes, I know this is unnecessary. You know, there is, I'm not trying to get from point A to point B by taking this rocket flight. Sure. It's an excursion. It's an adventure. Yeah. And so the, the rules for that are much less stringent than when you're trying to take grandma we're off to see the grandchildren. <laughs> sure. Doug, we're going to take some questions from our online audience now, if you don't mind. The uh, first one is from Edward Dury via Facebook, who asks, uh, in what ways do you envision private space travel becoming profitable? Um, well, quite simply, by keeping our, our costs, including amortization of our development, below the price that we're charging per seat. And we chose the $95,000 price uh, with with careful thought, knowing that we should be able to recoup all of our development costs and make a tidy profit at that price point and still be able to engage in a price war with the competition when the market, when the market grows and we want to get a larger share of it. Yeah. Uh, Edward also wants to know, and I'm going to interpret this uh, for him a little bit, if space privateers are going to be the Leif Erikson's of the future, and I think what he <laughs> means by that is if, uh, in a sense, do you see permanent human living in space in the next 10, 20 years? 
Um, we almost have permanent living in space now. You know, we have, we've had crews on ISS for more than a decade now. Uh, you know, the, the, the population count up there, you know, has averaged about three over the last decade. It's finally gotten back up to six. And uh, with, in the future, there'll be more people. It'll be more like um, Antarctica, that you rarely get people living there, yeah. living their lives out, having children there right. and so on. It's still part of the economic sphere of the world yeah. or um, offshore oil well platforms sure. where you don't get people living their entire lives there, yeah. but doing professional work there right. for, for companies that turn a profit. Sure. Uh, f even farther afield from Matt Edwards via Twitter, he wants to know, realistically speaking, when can we expect tourism to Mars, <laughs> even just flybys? Um, the, uh, the recent proposal for the Mars flyby was really quite impressive. I've met, you know, several of the people involved in that, and there's no reason to think they can't get it done. It's a, it's a straightforward enough mission. They've, people have done, you know, closed life support systems for that long. It's, uh, you know, it's based on Navy technology, for crying out loud, it, that you don't need to have a biological system. It's nice to grow a, a few fresh vegetables instead of having to survive on canned food for two years. Yeah. But yeah, certainly uh, whether it's tourism is kind of stretching the point because uh, these people will be getting paid to go rather than paying someone else for the privilege of going. Mm -hmm. But there's already been proposals for lunar flyby tourism at the price, price point of about $100 million per seat. Oh. And so far there's nobody taking, taking them up on it. Yeah. But that could be done in less than seven years with existing technology. Yeah. We flow. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to leave you in the <laughs> No, no, there. it's okay. I, it was a teleprompter issue. Um, thank you so much for your time here today. Um, uh, you know, th the vision of going into space, th there's been a great intersection between that and libertarianism for a long time. I, I think partially because people do see it as an arena for sort of new experiments and living beyond mm -hmm. just being, as I think you've known since you were a kid, one of the coolest things a human being could do. And uh, thanks for helping make it possible, and thanks for... Uh, being here today with us on Recent TV. Happy to be here. Thank you.